today than is a series that we're in called Live Full, Die Empty with this little strap line that says this, don't take your talent to the grave. Don't live empty and die full. We've been saying over the last three weeks that the wealthiest place in Netherton is the graveyard. Buried talent, buried treasure, buried stories, buried in the graveyard, never ever to be resurrected. Please, please be determined to live full, live five star, live with everything you have so that when you get to that day, when you meet Jesus face to face, he will not say, well, he'll say, well done. You don't want Jesus to say, well, you want him to say, well done. Good and faithful servant. So make a decision. It is not God's decision. He's made his decision 2,000 years ago and beyond about you. He loves you. He gave his life for you. It is now your and my decision to live out this life, however long, however short it will be, to live out with great determination that you do not take your talent to the grave. An unusual message last week about skill. One of the things you don't hear about in church because anybody will do. Anybody can play the keyboard. Anybody can play the drums. In fact, if you can't play the keyboard, you're welcome to play the keyboard in most churches. And uh, that's kind of a proviso. And we say, no, we've had, we don't want that. We want people with skill and talents. In fact, Psalm 33, verse 3, that's easy, 3, 3, 3. Very easy to remember. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. Now, I don't know about you, but I can shout. You said we've noticed. Yeah, my wife says uh, we know. We can shout. But we need to learn to play skillfully. So let me remind you before we get into today's message about it is this week. Adam, isn't it this week? Auditions night. It's pretty unusual to have an auditions night in a church, but we are not the average church. We ain't normal, and we refuse to be normal because people don't go to normal church. Auditions night starts at, I suppose on the screen, 7 o'clock. And basically we're saying instruments, voices, Whatever skill you need to bring. I've been amazed this week. I had a conversation with a guy in our church who said, oh, by the way, I used to be. So I said, well, you are. I used to be. Some of you have got amazing skills. You're timid. Well, you know, there's so many. Hey, come on, bring your skill to the table. Bring your talent. Never say champions does not give me opportunity. Hey, What's this called? This is your opportunity. But please come with a good heart because you may be told, sorry, that's not skill. That's dreadful. All right. Been knocked back back many times. In fact, at Mankind last night, our team won a block of chocolate for coming last but one. I know what it feels like, friends. So that's this week. Surrender your gift, surrender your talent, surrender your skill to the Lord. Now, let me say to everybody that says, but Mark, I don't have any skill or talent or anything. Listen, stop trying to work it out. Just offer yourself. Come as you are. Don't come to audition saying, and they put you on the platform with a mic and they say, so what are you going to see? Well, I just came as I am. Listen, you don't need to come to auditions night if you don't feel you have a skill or a talent or a gift. Every one of you has a talent and a gift. It's hidden. So today, after service, you go to Connections Lounge, sign up to serve, wherever it is in the building, and you simply say, listen, I'm giving you, I'm giving God myself. Here I am. Put my name down. We will work it out. Stop trying to work, well, I don't know where I'll fit, so I won't fit anywhere. 
Listen, be a minibus driver or surf somewhere. If you don't fit, then you can move to somewhere else. and See if you fit there. That's the way it works. Everybody out there. So let's make sure we make it big on Thursday night. AV, sound, all the technical stuff. Just turn up and say, hey, how may I serve? Is that good? Key verse today. Are you ready for the word of God? Are you ready? It's going to take a long time to read this. It's at least seven seconds. So make sure you don't miss it. Acts chapter 13. Verse 36, now when David, that's King David, one of the most famous kings in the Bible, had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. Let me just remind those of you who are nodding off right now, that word sleep is the word for the death of a follower of God. The word in the New Testament for death connected to a Christ follower is never D-E-A-T-H, but is A-S-L-E-E-P. When you close your eyes in this life, there will be no gap between your eyes closing and your eyes opening into eternity to meet Jesus face to face. Now, David When he had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. He was buried with his ancestors and his body decayed. Your body will decay. You will fall asleep. Death has a 100% success rate. Every one of us is going the same way. Do not be surprised that you will be in an obituary column one day in the Express and Star. You will be there. Your body will decay Things will start to deteriorate. But listen, he didn't die till he served the purpose of God in his generation. Let me make one quick point about that. I have taken, I've had to take a lot of stick over the years, and maybe you have to. I'm not the only one, of course. Over the years about Champions Church, we were a small Baptist church non-worshipping, non-Holy Spirit, non-miracle, non-instrument, no electricity, chapel. Everything that was beyond the church organ was demonic. Guitar strings were from the devil. Everything like that. I have had over the years to battle and battle and battle and battle and still do today in some quarters, when people say to me, oh, Champions is very, very modern, isn't it? Yes, it is. And very loud, yes, it is. That's the way we have it. And Champions, well, you don't sing the old songs, do you? Well, it depends when you come. We might have one or two at Easter. And, uh, but the truth is this. Oh, well, you know, you ought to. No, we aren't. And I'll tell you why. I am not here to serve that generation. I am here to serve my generation, and you are here to serve your generation. And if my generation knows hymns and sings hymns, we'll do hymns. We'll do hers if you want. But the truth is, they ain't. So we have to do songs in my generation. And have a guess what, young people? Don't you dare sing old Hillsong songs in your generation because you will not be in my generation. You're in your generation. Church has changed, and so it should. The average child is spending four, five, six, seven hours a day in front of a screen, everything out there. We expect them to come to church that hasn't changed. Listen, Stop getting old, fuddy duddy. I refuse to get older. I just want to get younger by the day and see the purpose of God in my generation. God does not hold me responsible for the generations that have gone. He holds me responsible for this one. This is my turn. This is the platform that you and I have to stand on. It is now our day. And woe betide anybody that keeps going, well, we ought to do this for the old people. We love old people. I'm almost one myself. My mom and dad, old people. Jillian's mom, old people. We love them at times. (laughs) They're the butt of every joke. I could write a book about family times with our moms and dads. 
Brilliant. We love them. We love every old person in our church. But we must remember we are, we are moving forward, not backwards. Okay, Mark, get off that. You've been on your soapbox long enough for that. All right, there we go. So it says then that David served the purpose of God in his generation. Then that's it. He snuffed it. If you're breathing today, God is not over. Some of you have decided, well, you know, leave it to the young people. Yeah, I agree. Let them get off their backsides. But don't you dare say it's over for you. While there's breath in your lungs, it's not over. He's got a purpose for you. And if you don't believe that, you better read about Abraham and Sarah. 99 years of age and giving birth. Just imagine that. Her earth suit needed ironing. She wasn't even fanciable. And yet they managed somehow to, you know what I mean? Don't you dare say it's over. It ain't over until it's over. You make sure you serve the Lord in your generation. So my most important question, the most important question today has got to be, how does it start for me? It's okay saying, well, that's how it's going to finish. The biggest question that I get asked is, where do I start? When do I start? How do I start? Lots of people, you know, have got a bit of a, as we say here in this area, got a bit of a bob on themselves. If your name's Bob, great, but it's not you. A bit of a bob on themselves, meaning they just feel like God's gift to Champions Church. Well, you are God's gift to Champions Church. So is everybody else, not just you. And it's like, well, no, nobody recognizes my talent. Probably you're not talented. <laughs> Nobody's putting me on the platform. You know, I, I've been here now at least three weeks, and nobody's invited me to preach. I'm going to end today with two stories. And I'm not going to prophesy, I'm just going to predict. Did you know that predicting is a gift? It's a very simple gift. Do this, you'll get that. Yeah. Every pastor needs to be able to predict. It's very easy. I watch what you do. I predict what you'll end up like. Yeah. I don't need to prophesy. Prophesy is a little bit too spiritual for some of you. You say, this is what I'm doing every day. Okay. Pastor, what do you think? Well, you do that every day for the rest of your life. This is what you'll turn up like. Yeah. It ain't good. So how does it all start? A thousand years from the day that David died, the writer of the book of Acts in the New Testament records the words that we read today. A thousand years later, the average person in the congregation this morning will not know the names of their great, great grandfather and mother. You won't. You go, hmm, that's how quickly you've forgotten. A couple of generations from now, once you've snuffed it, they won't even remember you. How come this guy, a thousand years later, said when David served the purpose of God in his generation, he died, fell asleep, went to be with the Lord? A thousand years. So I'm going to explore that in the next 19 minutes that we have remaining before the end of this service. And I want to answer what I believe is one of the biggest questions in the world right now. Is here I am. Tell me how to start. Thanks for asking. I'll tell you. It's pretty simple. And I want to go to what I believe is a key for today. And that is, have you ever looked in Cousins Furniture Shop window? You know the one that has the sale all the time? <laughs> sale now on. You're a liar. The sale's always on. <laughs> Biggest sale ever. No, it was the same last year. Great big posters. Never to be repeated. Yeah, you're going to repeat it next month. So be careful. But you drive or walk past cousins in the window. Showpiece of furniture. And you know in life, we tend to look at the shop window of people's lives. I mean, wow, I'm going to be like that. 
Or maybe you're not into furniture, maybe you're into that next level car. And so you go to that next level showroom and you look through the window and you even venture inside and you go, wow, look at that. Problem is, you don't need to go to the showroom of the furniture and of the motor car. Let me take you to the factory. Because the factory is what made it. There needs to be a look today beyond the showroom into the factory. If you wanted to cheapen it, which I don't really want to, but let's stop looking in cousins and go to Ikea. It's in a box. It's flat packed. Nobody likes a cardboard box. Even more, you hate the instructions. How many times have you and I built wardrobes from Ikea and you, your wife walks in and goes, wow, it looks amazing. Yeah, I've got seven pieces left. <laughs> if only I'd have looked at the instructions. No, I'm too clever for the instructions. And you kind of put the seven pieces in the bin and go, and then after about three months, it falls apart because the seven pieces were important. Today in church, stop looking like cousins and look like Ikea. Because we need people to come in boxes. And you say, please, will you help me to become a piece of furniture? God uses flat pack people. He doesn't go, wow, what a sofa in church this morning. Wow, look at that Ferrari over there. He said, hey, guys, come with me to the factory. So it's okay if we go to the factory today. Let's just go there and see what was modeled by Jesus. So here we go. John chapter 13, verse 3. Here's the words of Jesus, or rather the words about Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. Very important words here, that he had come from God and he was returning to God. Let me just make a point there quickly. He knew that he was on, all things were under his power. He knew where he'd come from. He knew where he was going. If you don't know God, if you don't know where you've come from and where you're going, you will never do what I'm going to talk to you about right now. You need to know who you are. In God, you need to know where you've come from and you need to know where you're going. Once you settle that issue of life and eternity, I have a guess you'll be as free as a bird. You don't worry about your reputation. It'll go before you. You don't have to worry. And this is what then happened. So, say so, he got up from the meal. This is Jesus. Who? Jesus. Son of God, God the Son, came from heaven, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist, and after that he poured water into a basin, began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel, and that was wrapped around him. That's our Jesus. All things were under his power, knew where he'd come from, knew where he was going. So he took off his outer garment became a waiter and said, guys, let me wash your feet. He then said, especially to Peter, who said, never, you're not going to wash my stinking feet. Jesus said, unless you let me wash you, you will never be part of me. Then he said, now go and do the same yourselves. I think it was James and Zebedee's mom who came to Jesus and said, Lord, my sons are great, you know. They're brilliant. Jesus is it okay? Maybe it was James and John. And uh, they said, uh, Mom said, Jesus, uh, I'd like our James and our John to sit one on your right and one on your left when you come into your kingdom. That's how good they are. Is it all right? And Jesus said, Woman, you don't know what you're asking for. You don't know what you're saying because you've got it all backwards. Let me say this with all the love in my heart to everybody here that feels that you should have a title and position. We don't have titles and we don't have positions here. You may have a badge. It may describe what you do. But listen carefully. We're not big into that thing. But what we want to be big at is what's coming next. Are you ready? Following mom saying about her boys, how wonderful they were, Jesus, in Matthew 20, 25, called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it or boss it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you, he said. Instead, are you listening? Whoever wants to become great among you, 
must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Here is our Jesus, and he says, hey, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. Wouldn't it be wonderful if everybody in church had that exact kind of feeling and sense of, I'm not here to be served. I'm here to serve. I don't know what it does with you when I read that passage and it says, if anybody wants, uh, to, if, if you want to be great, they must first be your slave. It kind of messes with my head because it's not a nice word. It has connotations. Oh, so we're going to be a slave. Be a slave in Champions Church. Do you know that this word slave is the Greek word doulos? And when we read it here, it is, the word doulos is the highest dignity afforded in all of the New Testament. The word doulos. And it literally means those who have resigned themselves to serving Christ and his mission. The word doulos. It is the highest calling of anybody on the planet. And it's unfortunately translated in English, slave. Get out of there. It actually means bond slave, which means I give myself freely Jesus to you so that I may serve you. In the next 30 seconds, we're going to stare at the screen. I want you to stare at the screen because I want us to have today a reality check. Is it okay if we do that right now? That moment when you are explaining to Jesus why you don't serve at church. That moment when you are explaining to Jesus why you don't serve at church. And you think he understands? No. The whole of the gospel hangs on this. I mean, well, you know, it, I just find it difficult. I, 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 I just can't get out of bed on time, Jesus went. So, you know, it's not in my nature to serve. I, I only want to be on the platform. You know what, Jesus, if he was here today and he is through my mouth, he'd say, get over yourself. Do you think that he went all the way to Calvary for you so as you can sit there and say, Jesus, I can't serve at Champions because, you know, Lord, and it's difficult and this. And Jesus said... No, I don't understand. Thank you. You take that off because all you're going to do is look at that. Here's a great piece of advice. Whenever you feel that you're the most important person in the room, grab a towel and serve. If you feel that you're the most important person in champions right now, grab a towel, serve. Mark, do you feel such a big shot? 30 years? Grab a towel. Serve. Grab a towel. Serve. Sign up. Serve the children. I was talking to one of our wonderful guys last night and he was telling me that he's had a saxophone in the loft for about 10 years. I know I keep harping on about this, but I'm going <clears> to <throat> preach it until we're reaching for what we're going to get. And he said, I've pulled it out the loft. So it's, it's come down. I said, well, hurry up. Hurry up and play. Grab a saxophone and surf. Grab a hand and surf. Grab a t-shirt, put it on and serve. If you said, Mark, what would be your dying wish be for this church? That we'd get this. We'd get this. A thousand years later, David's talked about serve the purpose of God in his generation. What's going to be said about you when you're gone? 
Interestingly, how did it start? 1 Samuel 16, I'm going to read this very, very fast. Verse 6, when they arrived, who arrived? Jesse's boys arrived. They're looking for a king. Saul is on the way out. We need now a God king. We need an anointed king. And when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab. You've never heard of him. Exactly. And thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height. I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. He's not interested in the size of your nose, whether your bottom sticks out, whether your belly sticks out. He's not interested whether your eyes are too far apart, whether you're bald, whether you're stupid, whether you're daft, or all three. He's not interested whether your feet are small or large, whether your legs are good or fat at the thighs. He's not interested. He doesn't consider what everybody else considers. He's not looking for Kardashian Christians. He's looking for people. He's not looking for your height. People look at outward appearance, he said, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab, never heard of him exactly, and made him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen him either. Jesse made Shema, Shabbat, pass by. But Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, is this it? Is this all we got? And he went, yep. Oh, hang on a bit. I've got a younger guy. There's still the youngest, Jesse answered. He's tending sheep. But he's going to be no good. He looks after sheep. You're looking for a king. We got the tall and the most handsome, but what about him? And the prophet of God said, hey, bring him. So he sent for him and bought him. Now, interesting, the, the Lord looks on the heart. But remember how he comes out here. He's amazing. He was glowing with health, had fine appearance, and had some features. I just want to say this. If you're gifted, blessed, anointed, and you look good, brilliant. But you don't have to. But do the best with what you got. If the shed needs painting, shed, uh, paint it. Yeah. All right, I'm coming on. And the Lord said, here he is. Rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took a horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brother. And from that day, the spirit of the Lord came upon powerfully upon David. And Samuel then went on to Ramah. In other words, that's it. Done my job. You can be the least of the least. You can be tending sheep. You could have been raised looking after babies in the crash. And you go, what's in it for me? And God said, you're the one. You've been looking after them. Do you know something? In Acts chapter 13, verse 22, after removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. Interestingly, David didn't do everything he wanted him to do. In fact, David murdered some, had somebody murdered and he slept with another man's wife. He had a child who entered the city with Solomon and Solomon went on to build the greatest temple ever for God. So if you've made a mess of your life, you are prime property for God to use you today. Stop looking at other people and going, if only I hadn't messed up. If only I hadn't done that. If only God said it. Don't worry. I can cover it all. You are going to be used. Isn't it amazing? Solomon came from Beth, uh, from Bathsheba, the naked woman on the rooftop, who was amazingly fanciable. And David fell with her and fell into bed. And their son became one of the greatest. Proverbs, wisest man in the world. What you're about to give birth to. Listen carefully, watch my lips. It doesn't matter how it started. It matters how it will finish. And I am going to predict to you, if you do what this says, I can predict for you an amazing life here. 450 years, God will search the planet. And it was 450 years. Read the Bible, book of Acts. It tells you exactly the years. God searched for 450 years and then looked and said, hey, Dave's my man. 
Thank you, David. And he's looking today. His eyes are all over this auditorium. He's looking for you to serve. I'm aware time is racing away, so I'm just going to get straight into this point right now. More than that, David, more than that, bigger than David, Elijah and Elisha, the double duo, men of power for the hour, the greatest prophets of God ever on the planet. And Elijah is coming to the ends of his life, end of his life. And Elisha goes to him and said, hey. And Elijah said, anything I do for you? And the young Elisha says, give me double what you've got. Elijah said to him, you don't know what you're asking for. He said, I do. I want twice what you've got. Elijah said, double trouble double anointing, double everything. If you want twice what somebody else has got, remember this, twice the trouble, twice the pain, twice everything else. Be careful what you're asking for. And it's interesting in 2 Kings chapter 3, when Jehoshaphat the king is looking for advice from somebody, Elijah has gone, died. The young man of God, Elisha, is now in situ, and Elijah and Jehoshaphat asked, Is there no prophet of the Lord here through whom we may, I may inquire of the Lord since the old guy's gone? An officer of the king of Israel answered, What a stupid answer! Elisha, son of Shaphat, is here. He used to pour water on the hands of Elijah. Now, watch the answer. Jehoshaphat said, the word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. And he brought the word of the Lord. Can you believe in searching for this double anointed man of God, in searching for the greatest, one of the greatest miracle workers in history, they asked, where is he? And they said, we can't find anybody, but there is a guy who poured water on the old man of God's hands. And they said, because of that, he's the man. And you can look at the miracles and you can look at the man, but look at the factory where he came from. And the factory where he came from was a factory of servants who said, how may I serve you, Elijah? How may I help you? Pour water on your hands. Ban, come on, let's get ready to close. Pour water on your hands. And they said, because he did that, you know, that you may be serving in this church week after week, and thank God that you are. I want to make sure that we get, just from this message alone, another hundred people who are going to serve in Champions. I pray that with all of my heart. We need to be at 350, not 250 something. Because what God is about to usher in is going to need not a stage full of professionals, and a stage full of people who want to be superstars, but a professional servants. Who are you pouring water on right now? Well, you know, when Pastor Mark arrives, I, uh, my job is to, uh, is to welcome him. And I, he must have asked for that. No, I've never asked for that. But do you think I'm going to rob somebody of a blessing when they open my car door in the morning and you say, well, you know, if you've got a bad heart, well, that's not right that the pastor of the church has somebody to greet him and open his car door. I'm sure he demands that. No, I can park my own car. I can open my own door. I can turn the engine off even. I can get out of the door. I can carry my own stuff. But do you think I'm going to rob somebody that chooses to serve after all these years of the blessing? Hello? Because I know that those who are doing that are pouring water. And their future in the factory is going to the showroom. Let me give you one quote on screen before I give you two examples. It is almost impossible for anyone to become a great leader before becoming a great servant give you two examples would you like to stand to your feet would you like me to prophesy or predict I ain't going to prophesy so I'm going to predict I've been watching the life of a young man for 30 years 
So you can, you know from that that he's now 30 years older than he was when I started watching him. And I've watched this guy and he has only ever wanted one thing, top dog. You know what that means? I'm going to be top dog or nothing. So wherever he's gone, he said, I'm top dog. 30 years. He said, so people have interviewed him and said, will you come and serve? Yep, I'll come and serve. In the first week, he said, I'm taking over. Top dog. He's gone to more churches, more interviews than anybody that I've ever known. And every time he turns up, people think he's amazing. But after the first week, they're pulling their hair out. Because he said, I'm taking that position. This guy wants to be the senior pastor of his own church. But he refuses for 30 years to serve any other man. And let me tell you, I'm predicting because I'm predicting based on fact. Let me tell you, for 30 years, that guy started there 30 years ago. And 30 years later, he is no different, no more, any further advanced than he was 30 years ago. Simple. Let me predict why. Because he has refused to pour water on the hands of anybody. He said, I'm the man. I'm the man. I warned somebody about him recently and I said, hey, if you take him on, he's going to take you on. I was right. He did. Out. There's something in him. Make sure it's not in you. Example one, example two. 17 years, a young man decided to serve his father who was the senior pastor of a church. A church of 5,000, 6,000, ending with 8,000. For 17 years, this guy edited all his father's television programs. And this young man edited everything his father ever did. And his dad continually said to him as he grew up, he said, son, why don't you, I want you to preach. And he said, no, dad, I'm only behind the scenes. I'll do all your camera work. I'll do all the editing. I'll put you on TV, but I'm not going to preach. His dad pleaded with him, preach, 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 preach. And he never would until January the 17th, 1999. Six days earlier at Sunday lunch, his dad said to him, son, Joel, Joel Osteen, his father's name was John. John said to Joel at the Sunday lunch table, Joel, something within me tells me next week you have to preach. And Joel, for the first time in 1999, said, yes, I'll do it. Six days later, his father dropped dead. He never preached before. 8,000 people in the church. And this young, humble man, now approaching and in his 50s, Joel Osteen, 44,000 people a week in church come to listen to this guy. All he did was pour water on his father's hands. So if you're a big shot, you better get out there, pick up a towel. Pick up a towel. Let's lift our hands. 10.50. We're not going to do a worship song. You can, you can sing behind what I'm about to pray if you want, but we're going to dismiss the service in a minute. So if you're expecting me to get off the platform, I'm not. I'm staying. So if you're serving, you can go in a minute. Father, there's a holy anointing in this service. Jesus said, come, come to the factory and I'll tell you how your life's going to be. Let me show you how great men and women of God are made. They are made with a towel. I serve, Jesus said, you serve. Stop giving me your excuses, lame excuses. I was beaten bloody. I died bloody. I had a crown of thorns mock my head. Hail King of the Jews. Five bleeding wounds. My hands, my feet, my side, my head. I gave my life for you. And all you can say is I can't make it. Friends, there is a move of God in this church. 
and it is not stardom it is not fancy it is simple when we each catch the spirit of the leader there is an explosion that heaven can only make in this church I appreciate that some of you are not ready right now I appreciate that God is doing a work in you and eternity only knows what is happening right now but let's take up that towel let's pick up our cross and follow him die empty Lord Jesus by the power of your spirit may be may we all be the man who pours water on the king's hands today Jesus I just pray release incredible power in this church miracles will flow let me ask you the question as we predict your future which is it you're going to be the guy who has been top dog for 30 years who is no no more advanced than 30 years ago or are you going to be the guy that served behind the scenes and said yes okay I'll do that and when asked to step up there's a power in you like never before Holy Spirit fall upon us this morning I pray for I pray this prayer and ask it in the mighty name of Jesus we thank you Father right now for an explosion of your power in the name of Jesus come on let's thank him for all his goodness right now thank you Jesus